What's up, everybody? Welcome into the Next Pats podcast. I'm Phil Perry. Two guests on today's Next Pats, both offensive linemen. We had Sebastian Vollmer earlier in the week. We're continuing our O-line love fest here today with Ross Tucker and former Patriot Marshall Newhouse. Two incredibly bright individuals, much smarter than me. Massive brains on these guys. Great playing experience in the trenches, which I think is a critical piece to our pre-draft content plan for you all is making sure we hammer these positions along the line, especially for a rebuilding team like the Patriots, because this is often where the smart teams start. Now, does it mean they necessarily pass on the possibility of taking a franchise quarterback at number three overall to build those lines? That's where I might fight you. And I did fight Tom Karn with this. I've continued to fight Tom Karn on this for weeks now, maybe a month, maybe more. Let's get into our back and forth a little bit. We're going to talk to Ross Tucker. We're going to talk to Marshall Newhouse. I also want to give you some of our prototypical Patriots at both guard and tackle. Some interesting names there for you based on the Ron Wolf executive tree history that we've been basing these prototypical thresholds on. All of these guys, whether it's Scott McLuhan in Washington or San Francisco or Reggie McKenzie with the Raiders or Brian Gutekunst, who is the current general manager for the Packers or John Dorsey, who is with Kansas City and Cleveland, under whom Elliot Wolf worked with the Browns for two years. There are a variety of names there for us to pay attention to. John Schneider is another one in Seattle. All these guys worked under Ron Wolf. They all seem to have their types along the offensive line. So we'll get into both the tackles and the guards. What I first wanted to do, though, was direct you to a piece that I wrote for NBCSportsBoston.com earlier this week titled, What are the odds if the Patriots hit a tackle and receiver if they trade back? Because this has been Curran's argument for a while. Pass on the quarterback. You're not ready. Those guys are good players. Jaden Daniels, he loves. He would take him uh, over Drake May, whereas I am the inverse. But if the right guy's not there for you, especially if it's a guy who's going to need some help in that offensive huddle, the way the roster's set up right now, don't take the quarterback. That has been Tom's take. That has not been my take, but it's been Tom's take. And part of the reason that's his take is because he sees a deep class. He knows it's a deep class of tackles and receivers in this year's draft. And so he says, well, go get your franchise left tackle. Go get your number one receiver. If you can trade down and hit on those two positions, you are much better set up for the next young quarterback, whoever that is, whether it's next year, the year after that, to be able to have some immediate success and be in a a healthy situation to be nurtured, to bring the most out of whatever talent there is in that quarterback's body. My retort is this. If you think you're hitting on both tackle and receiver, say you make that trade with the Vikings and you move from three to 11, you pick up 11 and 23 and a future first round pick. Great. Tremendous haul. But if you really think you're getting star players at 11 and 23, just because they're deep draft classes there at tackle and receiver, you got another thing coming at least. That's what the numbers would say. That's what history would suggest. In the piece that I wrote, I used pro football references, AV metric. Mostly because it's what Tom used in his uh, article on quarterbacks. That was out on the internet, NBCSportsBoston.com, great website, earlier this week. I believe it posted either Sunday or Monday, where he goes through quarterback AVs and what they provided their teams And he's looked at how much value there actually has been in taking a quarterback in the top three. And the numbers aren't great. And Tom's argument is, it's not necessarily that these players as individuals are bad players, but the situations they went to because they went to teams that were picking in the top three, i.e. they had to suck to get there. Those situations resulted in those quarterbacks not producing as much as you thought they would. Here's the issue. If you're taking a receiver outside the top 10, say you're taking a receiver at that 11 overall pick or anywhere between 11 and 32, there are 43 receivers taken outside the top 10, but in the first round over the course of the last 15 years, seven of those 43 provided what I deemed to be number one receiver results. And I think I was actually a little bit generous in terms of what I termed a number one receiver. 
I thought Zay Flowers out of BC had a tremendous rookie season for Baltimore last year. 77 catches, 858 yards, six touchdowns. That's something that Patriots fans and the Patriots themselves, I think, would be completely satisfied with if they took a receiver at 11 overall and they got those kinds of numbers. That is because Flowers was the 33rd wideout in football this past year in terms of receiving yardage. That, to me, is low-end, quote-unquote, number one receiver kind of output. So let's make that the baseline. Okay, what was his AV? He had an AV of nine last year for a really good Ravens team. That's pretty good. It's not amazing, but it's it's pretty good. For reference, Tyreek Hill, the best receiver in football last year, had an AV of 18. <laughs> so twice what Flowers got. And I'm saying you'd still be happy with what Flowers gave you at 11 overall, okay? But only seven of those 43 first-round wideouts taken outside the top 10 over the course of the last 15 years, only seven of them had career AVs that averaged out to be nine or more. Zay Flowers, after just one year. Chris Olave, after just two years. C.D. Lamb, Justin Jefferson, Brandon Ayuk, D.J. Moore, DeAndre Hopkins. There's some good names right there. All taken outside the top 10. All gave you an AV of nine or better over the course of their careers on average. But my goodness, seven out of 43, that's 16%. You like your odds of, of hitting on a true number one at number 11 overall? Never mind number 23. You like those odds at 16%? The odds would tell you you are much more likely to end up with, how about these names taken outside the top 10 in the first round? Nelson Aguilar, Devontae Parker, Nikhil Harry, Lacan Treadwell, Philip Dorsett, Corey Coleman, Jalen Rager. Ay, ay, ay you're much more likely to get a player of that ilk than you are a DeAndre Hopkins. As strong as this receiver class is, that's what history would suggest. 15 years, pretty good sample size, 43 players. How about a tackle? A tackle, I even dropped my threshold for what would be satisfying for the Patriots at number 11 or again, number 23. 36 tackles taken outside the top 10 in the first round over the course of the last 15 years. 36 players. 10 of them provided what I deemed to be, quote unquote, quality starter results. What's a quality starter? Good question. I went to PFF because I feel as though they do as good a job as anyone in terms of grading out offensive line play. Obviously, no statistics for us to reference there. So let's focus on the people who are watching the tape and doing their best to grade that thing out. And I've been told by players in the past, I remember having a conversation with Nate Solder a long time ago. This was in sort of the formative years of pro football focus. And they had all kinds of critics, more than they even have now. And I remember asking him, do you ever see those grades? Yep, he he had. What did he think of them? He thought they were pretty spot on for the most part. Of course, they don't know the responsibilities from play to play, but he had no issue with them. And that was... Gosh, maybe 10 years ago? So we go to PFF and we look at the number 20 through 30 graded tackles this year. So not all pros, not even pro bowlers, but good solid starters. And those guys in 2023 had an average AV. Again, there's that pro football reference metric there. They had an average AV of 7.0. That was last season. What's a 7.0? Jake Matthews of the Falcons, Brian O'Neill of the Vikings, longtime starters for their teams. They each have one career Pro Bowl, so they're not stars by any stretch, but they start every single year and they play a lot of football games and their teams are not looking to replace those guys. They both had AVs of seven last year. Okay, so that's essentially the caliber of player that I'm saying the Patriots would be okay with at 11 or 23. And just again, for reference, I gave you Tyree Kill's AV last year. It was absurd at 18. Panay Sewell, who was the first-team All-Pro last year at tackle for the Lions, arguably the best tackle in football, probably right there with Trent Williams. Sewell had an AV of 17. So I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for seven. (laughs) I'm just looking for a starter that you feel comfortable with year in and year out. That, to me, is a hit at 11 overall. but only 10 guys out of 36 tackles taken outside the top 10 over the course of the last 15 years satisfy that metric. Here are the names. Anton Harrison, who was taken last year by the Jaguars at the very bottom of the first round. 
Tyler Smith of the Cowboys, good player. Tristan Wirfs of the Bucks, great player. Jonah Williams, free agent Patriots could have had him, just signed with Arizona. Caleb McGarry of Atlanta, Colton Miller of the Raiders, Ryan Ramchek of the Saints, Laramie Tunsil, now of the, the Texans, and we know he's one of the best tackles in football. Nate Solder. There's that name again. Didn't think there'd be two Nate Solder men, uh, mentions on this podcast, did you? And Anthony Costanzo of the Colts. That's a 28% figure when it comes to 10 names against 36 players overall taken outside the top 10. 28% were lock them in starters or better with that 7 AV. Now, AV is not a perfect metric. Even Pro Football Reference mentions that. If you go in and you, you look and you read all about how they put it together and um, just how accurate it is in terms of describing value. But there's no perfect number, especially when we're talking about offensive linemen here. So I think it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good stat for us to sink our teeth into. And the fact that it's only a 28% hit rate along the offensive line, where you assume, well, that's an easier one to evaluate. First round, especially top half of the first round, 11 overall. First round period. You should feel pretty good about what you're getting there. 28% hit rate. Not what you're looking for, especially if you're passing on the opportunity to potentially draft a franchise quarterback. The worst case scenario is, just to further illustrate my point, you may pass on a Justin Herbert type or a Josh Allen type in Drake May at number three overall in order to move down and draft Isaiah Wynn and Akeel Harry. Talk about the whiff of all whiffs, if that's how it shakes out. But based on the numbers that we have here, we know you're more likely to end up with a win type or Makai Becton drafting outside the top 10 than you are a Laramie Tunsil, who I think actually skews this date a little bit because the only reason he was drafted outside the top 10 in the first place was because a gas mask bong video hit the internet the night of the draft. And so a lock top 10 pick that year ended up going, I believe it was 13 overall to the dolphins because of a viral video. All that is to say, all of these positions in the draft are gambles quarterback. Certainly. But if you think you're trading out of the opportunity to draft a franchise quarterback or a guy you thought would be a franchise quarterback who's really destined to bust to go ahead and take the sure thing at tackle and receiver. I'm here to tell you tackle and receiver are not sure things. Even if you're drafting in the first round, even if it's expected to be a strong class at both of those positions. And the reason I would support the idea of drafting a quarterback, even though I acknowledge it is a roll of the dice, is because the payoff is so great, so much greater than what you could get from a tackle or a receiver, or even both if you hit on both, that it's worth that dart throw. Because again, they're all, they're all dart throws. And if you hate the idea of dropping a quarterback into a bad situation, I give you C.J. Stroud, I give you Joe Burrow, Trevor Lawrence, Tua Tunga Bailoa, Kyler Murray, Matthew Stafford, Matt Ryan, Andrew Luck, Cam Newton, Joe Flacco, Eli Manning, Michael Vick, Donovan McNabb, Peyton Manning, Drew Bledsoe, all went to last place teams. Did they all win Super Bowls? No, of course not. Did those quarterbacks help make all of those teams relevant eventually? Yes, they did. And so if you're the Patriots, you have to be hoping for something similar. All right, let's get into our conversations that we have lined up for you this week. Let's start with Marshall Newhouse. Interesting back and forth between Marshall Newhouse and I. Uh, there was a, a bit of a, a, a tweet beef, a one-sided tweet beef, really, uh, with Marshall Newhouse. I mentioned something about how he might have helped allow a sack of Tom Brady during a regular season game in Washington. If you remember how Mar Marshall Newhouse got to New England, it was uh, mid-season, and Dante Scarnecchia loves Marshall Newhouse and praises his intelligence because he was able to come in on the fly and play right away. And it wasn't a disaster. Was it great? I don't remember it being great. But they felt like they could get by with him. And that was a huge deal because of how complicated it can be to play the offensive line for the New England Patriots. And so I mentioned something about how play didn't go so well for him, or so it appeared. And boy, oh boy, did he not love that. 
So we get right into that. We're just going to we're just going to acknowledge the elephant in the room, or at least from my vantage point. I'm sure he had no idea who I was. Didn't remember me one iota. Uh, but we get into that. We're now uh, simpatico. Uh, we that was water under the bridge. Uh, so you might find that part of the conversation to be maybe a little bit awkward. Hopefully not. I thought we had some fun with it. But the best part of the conversation to me is what he provides us in terms of his understanding of the offense that Alex Van Pelt is going to bring to New England. He's played in this scheme. Again, Kevin Stefanski, Alex Van Pelt, Stefanski works with Gary Kubiak, Mike Shanahan. They're all part of the Shanahan big old umbrella. And that wide zone run game and the play action off of it and why it's good for an offense, why it might be easier for players to be able to adapt to than some other schemes. Newhouse has has great, great instincts and intel for us because he's been in a number of different systems. Not only was he with the Patriots, not only has he been with the Packers and played in this scheme, Bengals, Giants, Raiders, Bills, Panthers, Saints, Titans. Over the course of a 10-year career, not many guys can say that, as a fifth-round pick out of TCU, over the course of a 10-year career, this guy knows NFL offense, and he knows NFL line play. And that's going to be the key, whether it's Jacoby Brissett or a young quarterback. How the Patriots perform offensively is going to depend so much on the performance of their offensive line and their running game, being able to make life easier for said quarterback, uh, that having somebody like Newhouse on to describe in some detail for us the scheme, I think is really, really valuable. So this conversation is from the Super Bowl months ago now at this point but uh for our offensive lineman love fest week this felt like a great time to drop this conversation in so hopefully you enjoy it all right very excited now to have with us on next pats marshall newhouse former patriots offensive lineman now doing some work on sirius xm radio marshall thank you so much for being with us thanks for having me all right so marshall i first have to get this out of the way yeah I'm fairly certain you would never remember this. Okay. But when you played for the Patriots. All right. And I've covered the Patriots since 2011. Okay. Um, there was a tweet that I sent out about a sack <laughs> that Tom Brady took. Oh. And Marshall Newhouse was somewhere on the offensive line. Let's just say that. <laughs> and you didn't like my tweet. And <laughs> oh, I man. wish I could pull it up now. It's long enough ago. I think it was 2019 when okay. you were with the team. Yeah. Whether it was that moment in particular, which, again, I'm, you probably don't remember. Or just media in general, yeah. commenting on offensive line play, <laughs> where you are the expert. Give me your thoughts on that, because I know this is a bugaboo for a lot of people in the league, because it is such a complex part of the game that's hard for the layperson or even the reporter person who's right. around teams every day to truly understand. Right. I think also, if we're talking about the context of my entire career, you weren't the only one, you weren't the first, you weren't the last. And, you know, some of it was warranted, but a lot of it wasn't. So I was probably too online. I probably shouldn't have been reading that stuff regardless. But I do feel like I'm in a place now to add context. And that's all I wanted to do was add context. I remember there was a play when I was in Green Bay where it looked like I gave up just a complete whiff sack on a screen. And so no one said, hey, this is a slow screen where the running back forgot to leave. They just said, look at him getting beat like a drum. And I was like – you want to defend yourself and advocate for yourself, but sometimes it looks kind of stupid and you're like, why am I even caring? And so I just want to provide context as much as I can for an understood, uh, an un, a misunderstood position. That's all that is. I, I totally get it. Yeah. And I'm sure I deserved it at the time, <laughs> whatever your reaction was. Yeah. We're both more mature. We're better well, off we, now. Yes, 100%. <laughs> and now we're able to repair our relationship, which, I, which I'm a, a big fan of. Yeah. But it is, you know, especially in New England now. Yeah. This is how we can tie it back to the Patriots. They've had problems along their offensive line really the last two years. Changes on the coaching staff, changes in scheme. They're going to go through it again this year in 2024. They're probably going to have a new quarterback. How difficult is it for somebody like, guy that you played with, and David Andrews, to be going into his fourth offense in as many years? Is it as complicated as it may seem to us on the outside? Yeah, I mean, just because you're never playing in a vacuum in the offensive line. You're always reliant on, if you're David, both guards, if you're a tackle, the guard next to you or sometimes a tight end next to you, you're reliant on the play caller and situationally and all that stuff. So uh, you're never in a vacuum. And so turnover is a difficult thing. I remember, for instance, when I signed with New England, I signed people, you know, I don't know if people know the story. I'm telling it now. I signed on a Wednesday morning. I got thrown right into meetings. I ended up starting at ta right tackle on Sunday in Miami. 
Uh, middle of the game, Isaiah Wynn goes down. I flip to left tackle. The amount of things that I had to process in my brain just to start at right tackle in four days and then flip is a lot. Not to mention the guards that I was playing next to. There's just there were guards that I played years next to where there became an unspoken language where I, I could grunt huh, and he knows what I'm talking about. Or I'd say, I'm here, I'm gone, and they know what I'm talking about. That takes time. And so with turnover, the cohesiveness of a group, it's hard to do. It doesn't mean you can't be successful, but it's a difficult thing. And a guy like him, he's a veteran, he'll be able to roll with the punches. Um, he'll be able to bring along the guards that he's with, but it is definitely a difficult thing. You know who really appreciated your ability to pick up the offense as quickly <laughs> as you did and, and perform was Dante Scarnecchia. Yeah. Because he still talks about it, Marshall. We talked to him, we have talked to him a number of times on this podcast. He's still in the area, still follows the team very closely. But when he brings up how complicated it is to get people ingratiated in new offenses, he brings up you as the exception. Oh, wow. That's not the rule. Right. Because usually it takes an entire offseason, spring, sure. training camp, game planning it's during the week. It's a lot. So for you to be able to do that is really impressive. A little, little Shout out Scar. He's the best. Just the best. Yeah. What made him the best? Listen, he was hard and like demanding. And so it was a shock to my system just from his style, but being new and trying to get caught up. And as a veteran, you had to humble humble yourself to like the style that they do in offense, offensive line room and the individual period. But, you know, at the end of the season, we had a great conversation. I still call him every year. I was just like, I know that he cared about me. I know that he wanted me. He saw more potential in me. That was my uh, 10th year, ninth year in the league. He saw more in me to get out of me, and I was appreciative of that. And so uh, that I'll always respect that, and, and I look back on that fondly, even though it was very difficult to do. In the Patriots system uh, that Dante Scarnecchia was coaching, it looks like he's going to be different from the one that they're about to adopt, and it does have some um, ties back to this game, the Super Bowl, that we're all here for in Las Vegas. It looks like new offensive coordinator in New England, Alex yeah. Van Pelt. I don't know if you crossed over with him at all. We but were in Green Bay. He was a quarterback's coach at the time, but he's an exceptional mind on offense, so I think that's a really good hire. Well, let's get your thoughts a little bit more on Alex Van Pelt because we've been looking for people that, that have crossed over with <laughs> yeah. him, and that is that is the word, is that great human being, yes. right? Really good for in the room, good culture guy yes. is what I've been told. Uh, but what can you tell us about Van Pelt as a football person? Uh, I mean, he's just a, he's a, a guy's guy, but just with a high level of accountability. Like, he's trying to coach the game, but he, he – in the vein of a lot of the new guys from maybe the McVay system, he's trying to put his players as they are in the best situation to succeed. Obviously pushing them to be more and be better, but he's, he's in, he lives in reality where he's like, I, 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 hope that, I wish this guy would be this, so I'm going to coach as if he is what I'm I, in my head instead of this is who he is now. I'm gonna, let me lean into his strengths. Let me try to hide some of his flaws so we can run our offense, so we can score points, so we can win. And that's just a, a humility level that I think he has. He's got experience coaching with Aaron Rodgers. He was the uh, OC or co-OC quarterback coach in Cleveland. Seen a lot of really good, talented people come by, and I think he's also a good manager of men. People respect him. He comes to you with respect, and I think that'll be a great thing in that building with a, a, just an entirely new regime change. Listen, Gerard Mayo is – descendant from Bill Belichick, but things will be different. I think his opening press conference showed that, uh, and I think that's an okay thing. I think people can embrace that, and so people need to be open to things feeling and looking a little different. I think Alex Van Pelt is a guy who can adapt, uh, who will also just put guys, again, in the best position to succeed. Green Bay, West Coast kind of offense, sure. right? As somebody who's played in a number of different offenses. Can you tell our listeners, who are very used to watching the Tom Brady offense, sure, sure. right, and everything that entailed, how the West Coast "quote unquote" offense might differ? Yeah, I mean, it's it's in its you know origins, it's built on timing. Uh, there's a lot of three-step drop, five-step drop. Very, it's I wouldn't say it's rigid, but it allows a lot more fluidity within structure. Um, and so I don't think Alex Van Pelt is like completely beholden to that, but there will be elements of that. And I think if, a, if you can get a quarterback in who understands that, and it takes a lot of the processing out, where you're like, all right, pre-snap, I see this, 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 I get to go here. Uh, move on to the next play. It might be just a three-yard game, but we're staying ahead of the chains. We're moving the ball, and then we take our shots, and then we find a mismatch. And so I think it's an incredible way to bring young guys along, especially quarterbacks, because it, it simplifies things while also making keeping them dynamic. So there's still going to be points to be had. He's still going to take shots, but he's going to bridge the gap in between those mo uh, opportunities to take shots with just like playing solid football running the ball into op like uh, you know optimum looks um, getting out of bad looks just to get 
to a play that's not going to kill our drive, but get, get us to the next opportunity to take advantage of a matchup. It's just this non-stop arbitrage of opportunity to get your guys successful. And I think people lose sight of that where they're like, they want explosive every play. They want it to look like this. I'm like, no, there's just a play that might be a little boring and might not make sense to you, but there's a purpose for that play. The purpose of that play is they, the defense, they get paid too. They had a, a bad look and we're just going to run the best thing we can into that look, get us on the next play, get us another opportunity to make a touchdown. So I think he brings a lot of that. I'm sure he, he's, he's gleaned a lot from the coach he's been with. And uh, I'm excited for him to get his opportunity. An arbitrage of our opportunity. <laughs> That's how we need to start calling this Alex go. Van Pell offense moving it's forward. It's everywhere, well, yeah. And, and the reason why I bring up Super Bowl 58 and, and how he is in a roundabout way and his offense is connected to this game mm -hmm. is that everybody's trying to capture. You mentioned the McVay offense, yeah. whether it's the McVay offense, the Shanahan sure. offense, whatever you want to call it. It's one of those two things that it's really exploded across the NFL. Definitely. Van Pelt coached under Kevin Stefanski, who worked a long time with Gary Kubiak, yep. who worked a long time with Mike Shanahan. So that might be, and I don't know if you know Alex Peters, it sounds like he might be the offensive line coach okay. for the Patriots moving forward, worked with Van Pelt in Cleveland. That might be the offense they adopt in New England now. Based on everything you're telling us, is it a cheat code for quarterbacks? Again, for a team that might be adding a young guy, Marshall, is that why you might like this scheme is because it makes it easier on that all-important position? I wouldn't call it a cheat code, but it does, it does shorten the learning curve for a young guy or a new guy. And it's ultimately about matchups. And so if the matchup is we want to take a shot here with this guy, we've got to scheme the protection first. We're going to we're gonna pass and set up the run. So we're going to run play action early on early downs and, and get the linebackers going side to side stepping up or stepping back we're going to manipulate them early so then that opens up lanes for other running opportunities with two tight ends and then we'll set up another pass another boot another this another that so it's always running things with a purpose to set things up later down the line and I, that is absolutely advantageous for quarterbacks and so uh once i don't know who will be the, the the signal caller qe1 but things are all settled but it'll get them in a position to listen we got it's funny we're sitting we're sitting near cam newton and we got into that game manager conversation, but like, that's a compliment to me. Like that is knowing who you are and at the base level, I run this office as efficiently, I take the plays that are there, and then in moments, I rise above that with my talent and my just raw instinct and skill. But I gotta do the, the normal things first. I gotta take the check downs first. I gotta do the, the protection adjustments first. I gotta send the running back here first. So all that small stuff leads to these other moments where then you see quarterbacks who are unleashed and who are having career years like Jared Goff. Um, but it is it's QB friendly and it shortens the learning curve, absolutely. Marshall Newhouse can understand why, and the listeners can too, why you were one of Dante Skarnecchia's favorites. Massive brain <laughs> right here, played for a lot of different teams. Again, you understand it. Thanks for being with us here with our team on the next Pats podcast. Really appreciate Thank the time, you. buddy. I appreciate it. Great stuff there from Marshall Newhouse. Glad we could get past our differences and move on and have the conversation that we had. They really appreciate him spending some time with us. And let's transition now right to Ross Tucker. Uh, you know him. You love him. This guy is everywhere. He's broadcasting games. He's all over Twitter. He is one of the brightest minds in football media, in my opinion. And he has some Patriots background, which we we're going to get into. But he also has background with Alex Van Pelt. It knows him from their playing days together. And so some insight here, not just on the scheme. We get the scheme part from Marshall Newhouse. Now uh, you'll hear a little bit more about Alex Van Pelt, the person. I had a lot of fun with this conversation again from Radio Row at the Super Bowl. Here's Ross Tucker in Vegas. All right, very excited now to have with us on Next Pats, Ross Tucker, the great Ross Tucker, who is brought to us by Seat Club. Ross, tell us a little bit about Seat Club before we launch into our ball conversation. All right, so first of all, you need to introduce me as former New England Patriot. That okay? is true. That those, is true. Th those last 17 snaps against the Dolphins in week 17 of 2005, those were memorable. That was not. That and also, by the way, you know my claim to fame, Phil? I only ever played in one playoff game. The first playoff game that Brady lost. Brady, I think, was 10-0 and until the, in the playoffs until they put me in. So we found the reason why. Anyway, seatclub.com is absolutely amazing. <laughs> no, I literally just found out about it. It's funny because... So that you know, would have been 05? 
Well, 2005. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, 2005. Yeah. Which, by the way, was a great story because I was able to talk to when I did the Ole Miss Alabama this year. I talked to Saban. He was a Dolphins coach for the Flutie Dropkick game. Yes. That's a game I played in, and I said Belichick played me for like the whole second half of the game, so he must not have really been trying to win the game, which he loved. Saban loved that. There, there was a, that wasn't also the game where Matt Castle threw it out of bounds on purpose. Were you there for that? Yes, he <laughs> did. He says he didn't. He says he didn't. I know. Can you believe that? We're with Castle all the time. He he, of course he did. <laughs> <laughs> it's like statute of limitations by now, Castle. Like, it's okay to come totally, out of now. Totally, totally agree. I was on the field something. for that play. You were. I was on the field for that play. He must be, like, getting paid under the table to not admit that Belichick said, under no circumstances do you complete this two-point conversion. So you didn't know that in the huddle at the time? Absolutely not. This is great and inside asked, baseball talk. I've we asked are him, hardcore Patriots fans here that are listening to us. I, I have asked him just one-on-one. Like, dude, just be honest. Like, Belichick told you. Because we wanted to play the Jags, not the Steelers. Right. I'm like, just be honest. Like, Belichick told you not to complete the pass. He's like, no, no. He's like, it's just a bad throw. No, I'm like, dude, are you kidding? That was, that was one that of the bad. worst throws I've ever seen. <laughs> it was. It wasn't even Speaking close. Speaking of bad. Okay. How about people paying 25 to 35% markups, hidden fees? You got to go to seatclub.com. I just found out about it. You know how popular Taylor Swift was up there, the, the concert no, she had? Well, think about how much people were paying in terms of fees and the upcharge. Cclub.com, just found out about it. It's like the Costco, okay, of tickets. $99 a year, annual membership. They have the same inventory, but no fees, no markup. Some guy, I just found out, some guy paid $32,000 for Super Bowl tickets and sold, and, and saved 7000 grand. Wow. 7000 grand. Not many people say that. <laughs> 7,000 grand. <laughs> anyway, One Club. of the smartest com. people who's Use ever played Ross. for the Patriots, but he also says 7,000 7, grand. 7,000 grand. Either way, sounds that like is phenomenal. Sounds like a candy bar. It sounds amazing. It really does. They're saving people some money, which we appreciate. Right, let me we appreciate you for being Patriots. here. Well, I was I'm just going to say, rebuild the Patriots for us. First of all, what's the first step? But then I also want to hear you on how long you think this might take for the Patriots to get back to contention because it's a little bit of a depressing conversation that's happening in the Boston area right now. So – can I be honest and tell you I'm a little bit annoyed by the Patriots right now? I haven't liked any part of their offseason process. And I'm not anti-Patriots at all. In fact, love Mr. Kraft. I just don't understand why they wouldn't interview any other coaches before they hired Mayo. What, what could possibly be the logic? Like, think about any of Mr. Kraft's other businesses. If you could get a free consultant to come in and go over your business for four hours, for free. Why would you not do that? And then you hire someone internally who only knows the Patriot way. Everybody I talk to, the McCordys, they rave about Gerard Mayo. He might be the best coach of all time. I have no idea, right? My point is, I don't like the process at which they arrived at Mayo. And by the way, even if you interview other guys and then you still hire Mayo, it makes it look like, you know, well, we interviewed these other guys, but Mayo was still the best. And he was now, overly qualified. And now they're right. going to be the only team in the NFL without a GM? Like, why? It feels to me like the Patriots still think, Phil, they're smarter than everybody else and that they can do things different than everybody else. Like, what is the deal with that? So, to play devil's advocate on Gerard, but I want to ask you about the general manager situation, too. It was written into his contract that he would be the successor, right? I wonder if there was some leverage on Mayo's end where – He's dying to have a head coaching opportunity. He had already done a handful of head coaching interviews. And the Kraft said, boy, we, we just can't let this guy leave. We love him that much. If he really is, is desperate for us to write it into his contract or else we might lose him, I could see it shaking out that way. The one that's more confusing to me is general manager because you're right. I don't think they plan on naming an actual general manager. But whether you're, you've got that title or you're a VP of player ops or – if you have control of the 53-man roster, you're essentially the general manager. Yeah. Why do that and give that power to Elliot Wolf without inviting other people into the building for the same reasons you just mentioned, a head coach? It makes absolutely no sense. Um, like, they, they've essentially, all they've done is moved Belichick out, but they've kept the Patriot way in every way. I, I just, I am shocked. They didn't even interview anybody else for the front office job, did they? That, that we know no of. interviews nope yeah no interviews for gm no and, and and mayo no matter how different he is from a personality standpoint from bill he still only knows the patriot way he hasn't been exposed and he, has, he never even played or coached for any other team uh it might work out 
I, I would just tell you that I really think it's a really poor process. Everything that's happened in New England this offseason. Russ, were you hoping to interview for the head coach and or general manager position in New England? Is that why we're hearing, uh, all, why we're hearing to, this? I'd be happy to talk to him. <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to talk <laughs> to him. All right, well, here's make at, your pitch. At, at, least, at least I have been with other organizations. At fair. least I have different perspective playing for five teams. That's fair. Make your pitch right now. What's the first thing you do this offseason from a player's standpoint, from a roster standpoint, to try to get this thing back on track? Yeah, I think um, – I thought it was interesting to hear Mayo talk about them spending a lot of money, burning some cash, because obviously I know you know that hasn't been the reputation in recent years. I think the defense is already, depending on health, in not a bad place. I would like to make sure you get the offensive tackle settled, and I think you have to draft a quarterback number three overall. There's enough good guys this year, and if you're the Patriots, you can't expect to be drafting up that high, and it is a rebuild. They're, They're not like... This is not a, a bring in a, a veteran quarterback, uh, Justin. I mean, Justin Fields is actually interesting. But this is not a bring in a veteran quarterback and we can be competitive. They can't look at it that way. They need to look at it like it, it might be a rough year, but we're hopefully eventually going to get to a better place. If you don't love any of those quarterbacks that could be there at number three overall, would you trade a third-round pick for Justin Fields and say, let's see how it goes. If he blows us away, he's only got one year left on his rookie deal. He blows us away, we'll figure it out. But let's add pieces. Let's add a tackle. Let's add a receiver. This offensive side of the ball is so bereft of talent right it now. Is. Maybe we should do that first before dropping a young quarterback in there into a, what looks like a horrible situation. Well, I think you said the operative word. It really all depends on how they feel about these quarterbacks. If they really like... Jaden Daniels or Drake May or J.J. McCarthy or whoever, I think you need to take them. If they don't, there's a lot of places where they could get better. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of sad what's become of their roster. I mean, it's a bottom five roster in the NFL, and it felt like it happened, maybe not overnight, but it felt like it happened pretty quickly. When you draft as poorly as they've drafted, yeah. it's, it, that's just how it goes. Unfortunately yeah. for them, you like the idea of drafting a quarterback. Do you have one? Have you watched enough of these guys? At the top of the draft, to, to say one would be your favorite, Ross, and especially, maybe even, given the change at offensive coordinator, it looks like they're running one of these McShanahan types of offenses okay. with Alex Van Pelt. So is there a guy that, to you, sort of fits that mold? Yeah, I mean, I, I really like Drake May. I like Caleb Williams as well. Um, I think everybody does. I'm really curious to see what the narrative becomes over the next couple months. Because up until this point, as you know, Phil, it's only really been the scouts watching these guys. Now is when the coaches will really dive into it. So there's going to be quarterbacks. I don't know. Maybe it's J.J. McCarthy goes up. Maybe it's Jaden Daniels goes down or vice versa. But there's going to be guys that go up and down as the coaches, like an Alex Van Pelt, teammate of mine, by the way, Buffalo in 2003. Um, That's the advantage, by the way of being a journeyman that got cut and traded and stuff a lot. I, I pretty much have – I know everybody in the league. You've touched every corner of the it's, NFL it's in one way, shape, or form. Um, I think Alex, by the way, will do a nice job, and I'm happy for him to get that opportunity. But it's funny. I'd be curious to hear what he thinks at quarterback because, you know, when we were in Buffalo together, Bledsoe was the starter. And so Bledsoe was like your typical big, strong arm guy. I don't know if that's – you know, what he likes or what Alex would pick, but I'd be curious to hear what he does. Can you tell us a little bit about him as a person? Because everything that I've heard is that as a human being, he'll blow you away. He's great for the room. He'll be great for their culture, whatever that looks like moving forward. What was he like to be with in the locker room? Very authentic, very genuine. I would not say he is the most uh, outgoing guy or necessarily, he's not going to be the loudest guy in the room, okay? But Everyone will respect everything he says. He'll have the respect of all the guys just based on how he carries himself. I mean, there's a reason why Aaron Rodgers, you know, swears by him. All these guys. I have no idea, by the way, what happened in Cleveland. Do you, have you heard anything about it? He wasn't even calling the plays. I don't know what happened there. It sounds as though the front office, which is very analytically driven, felt as though they could upgrade at that spot. I think in part because of what they got out of Deshaun Watson the last couple of years. And so – it was Which not a funny, move, by the way, my understanding, that the coaching staff loved. I think they feel as though um, they've been a bit screwed <laughs> by, by that decision. He wasn't even calling plays. 
Right. Like that's the thing I don't understand. Like, it's weird to fire an offensive coordinator when he's not calling plays. Almost wonders. They're blaming someone for Sean Watson not being as good as they want him to be. Right. Ross Tucker, you're everywhere. Thank you so much for being with us here on Next Pats. You, of course, are with us courtesy of Seat Club. So we appreciate you sharing some info on that as well. It's something that hopefully our listeners, our viewers, can take advantage of. My pleasure. Use the code Ross. It really is awesome. There's no reason to be paying all those fees, especially for any – how about the Army-Navy game? How expensive the tickets were up there? I called that game. That was awesome, by the way, up at Gillette. Great Seatclub.com. Thank you so much, Ross. Appreciate it. My pleasure. It. All right. Great stuff there from Ross. Really appreciate him being on with us. And now I feel as though the best way to wrap up this offensive lineman love fest week is to go through our prototypical Patriots, both at tackle and on the interior of the offensive line. Let's start a tackle because we know that's the greater need for the Patriots, especially at left tackle. What I found fascinating after digging through the histories of this Ron Wolf executive tree. So Ron Wolf himself, Ted Thompson, Brian Gutekunst, John Dorsey, John Schneider, Reggie McKenzie, Scott McLuhan. After digging through what these guys have invested in, really invested in, I'm talking first and second round picks at the tackle position, what stood out to me was, boy, do they love their athletes along the offensive line, and especially at this position. There were 15 first and second round Wolf Tree offensive tackles that we studied and that we had combine information for. We didn't have any info, could not come up with info for the life of me for Ross Verba who was a first-round tackle taken by the Packers in 1997. So there were 16 players total. We have information for 15 of them. Here's what we found. They had an average height of six foot five and a half, an average weight of 311 pounds, average arm length of 34 inches, average hand size of just over 10 inches. Nothing unbelievably remarkable in terms of the physical profile, but it's the movement skills that really stand out. The average broad jump for these guys, 74th percentile. The average short shuttle time, 4.63 seconds, 73rd percentile, well above average in both cases. When you're talking about the 10-yard split, 1.76, that's essentially what you're looking for for high-end picks, even today. Uh, That ranks in the 64th percentile. These players that we were looking at, they, they tended to be pretty damn good in almost all of these categories, resulting in a relative athletic score, RAS, this is courtesy of our guy Kent Lee Platt, Phenomenal at Math Bomb on Twitter. Great information about test scores, height, weight, speed. He combines them all together to come up with a relative athletic score to tell you just how rare these physical specimens are. And for the tree that we're looking at, the 15 players that we studied, their average RAS was an elite score of 8.38. Really, really good. Eric Fisher was a first overall pick for John Dorsey back in 2013. Colton Miller. Fantastic athlete, almost a perfect 10 RAS, drafted by Reggie McKenzie in the first round in 2018. Scott McLuhan drafted Joe Staley to the Niners, perfect 10 RAS score. Brandon Scherf uh, to Washington, fifth overall pick. He ended up playing guard, but McLuhan, if you go back and you look at it, was very clear. He really was hoping that Scherf was going to play tackle for them. He was drafted to play tackle. Almost a perfect 10 RAS score, 9.78. So these guys are next-level athletes. That's what we found. If you've got that RAS score we're looking for, 8.38, and if you have long enough arms, this was the other interesting part of this study, 11 of the 15 guys we had information on had at least 34-inch arms. So that's not incredibly long, but it's almost standard. And if you didn't have it, you had to have something else that was pretty extreme in a positive direction to get you drafted in the first or second round by one of these guys. So. Long enough arms, 34-inch arms, great athlete. You'd be surprised that really cuts down on the players available in this year's draft class that even fit that bill, that fit that suit. So who are they? Joe Alt out of Notre Dame, six foot nine almost, 321 pounds, really quick, 991 RAS score, ridiculous 451 short shuttle time for a man that size to be that quick is just absurd. Olu Fashano from Penn State, he checks almost every box as well. The only one oddity with Olu Fashano, eight and a half inches. That doesn't even crack the first percentile. That is a Isaiah Wynn sized hands. Very, very small sized hands. And so if you're big on having big old mitts to be able to latch on to defenders and not let go, you don't want to hold, of course, but we know there's a lot of holding in between the shoulders well, on the chest plate, ideally, for offensive linemen. Uh, if you're scared off by Olu Fushano because of his small hands, I kind of get it. 
But otherwise, fantastic athlete, plenty of length. He's going to be a first-round left tackle. Troy Fautanu. If you listen to our last Next Pats podcast, you know that Troy Fautanu went to the Patriots with that 11th overall pick. We did our Tom Curran memorial. <laughs> I don't know why I called it memorial. We did our Tom Curran inspired, better way to put it, mock draft earlier this week. Patriots did do that trade that I have been saying they shouldn't do for a while now. And they trade from three to 11 and 23, and they take Fautanu at 11. Now he's only six foot four. But again, height, not the biggest deal for this Ron Wolf executive tree. It's more about length and athleticism. And Fautanu's arms are 34 and a half inches. That's plenty long. And his RAS score is 945. Plenty strong. 91st percentile vertical jump, 90th percentile broad jump. Tremendous, explosive athlete. I've heard friend of the podcast, Daniel, Daniel Jeremiah, excuse me, say that he might have truly five position flexibility along the offensive line, both guard spots, maybe even center if you really wanted him to. You start him at left tackle, in my opinion, because that's the most important spot. That is the most valuable spot. And then if it doesn't go great, then sure, you move him somewhere else and probably have a 10-year pro at another position. But to me, he has all the movement skills and the demeanor. He is nasty. He is mean in a fantastic way. I mean that as the highest of compliments in terms of what he shows you on the field. He's a prototypical Patriot this year because of what we've seen from that Ron Wolf executive tree. Much taller guys like Amarius Mims, Tyler Guyton, they still have the movement skills and the length to end up on this list. Patrick Paul, who we've talked about before on the podcast, I've mocked him to the Patriots at the top of the second round before. Great relative athletic score, 975. Um, only allowed one quarterback hit last year, no quarterback sacks and 469 pass block opportunities. Little bit raw, but six foot eight, 331, good mover, 36 inch arms. Yes, please. Day two, yes, please. Uh, one name that I find to be among the most interesting and maybe a real target for the Patriots because apparently it was recently reported in the last 24 hours or so by Tony Pauline, longtime uh, coverer of the draft. He reported that the Patriots are going to have on a 30 visit Kingsley Sua Mataia of BYU, six foot five, 326, another player, not the tallest guy in the world. Who cares? 34 and a quarter inch arms, 10 yard split of 173, broad jump of nine foot two, RAS of 938. He's got all the tools. And when you see him move in space, you watch some of his tape, he is devastating on the move for an offensive line that might be based in this wide zone scheme for a passing game in New England because of the elements, maybe in part, that is always valued the short passing game, especially the screen game. You know, does, does this offense do something similar under Alex Van Pelt in some ways because it helps your young quarterback make some easy completions? It helps Jacoby Brissett if he's in, in there, get some easy completions. Get this guy, Kingsley Sua Mataia, in space and watch him go to work. Tremendous. And again, maybe he's available to you at 34 overall. Those are your seven tackles that made our prototypical Patriots series this year. Let's talk just very briefly about some of the interior guys. Um, again, what's interesting here, in terms of studying what this Ron Wolf executive tree has done in the past, you're not going to see a lot of first-round names here. Jermaine Effetti was a first-round pick of John Schneider and the Seahawks a few years ago. 888 RAS score, good size, 6'6", 324. I think there were some who were thinking he might play tackle. He has not. He's been an interior player, but he had tackle guard flexibility, and that is something that I do want to point out when, you when we talk about prototypes on the interior. Flexibility, a must. Every guard that I could find or center drafted in the first, second, or third round by this Ron Wolf executive tree came into the league with perceived position flexibility. Austin Corbett and Mitch Morse, I think, are two names for us that should be brought up and brought up early because they were drafted to Cleveland under John Dorsey. Austin Corbett, second round pick when Elliot Wolf was there as assistant GM. You can actually go back and you can find video of Alonzo Highsmith and Elliot Wolf, two Patriots executives, talking about drafting Austin Corbett out of Nevada in the second round. And they were hoping at the time, again, they're pretty open about it. They were hoping he could play tackle. He ends up as an interior guy with really three position flexibility. This is Highsmith on the Corbett pick back in 2018. Quote, 
I see him as a good football player, very multifaceted. He can do a lot of things out there. He can probably play center for you. And I think one of the best things you want to do is you want to add good football players to your team. And it's a great problem to have a guy that can play a bunch of different positions. Whether it's Mitch Morse, who has been a career center in the NFL, but came into the league as a tackle. And I think people thought, okay, maybe he'll have some guard flexibility. He's played nothing but center, but was a tackle in college. Elton Jenkins of the Packers, guard, tackle, center flexibility. We already spoke about Jermaine Effetti. Ethan Posick, another higher-end pick. O Schneider to the Seahawks, left guard, right guard, center. Damian Lewis, Seahawks, center, right guard, left guard. John Moffitt back in the day for the Packers, left and right guard. David Boss, guard and center. How about even Gabe Jackson? He's a bigger-bodied guy. Draft pick of Reggie McKenzie's in the Raiders, 6'3", 336, but at least he can play both guard spots, and he has. So you have to have some position flexibility. The other what seem to be critical factors. This is just based on their history and who they've drafted early in these drafts. Uh, and some of the players, again, I've already mentioned, Elton Jenkins, Mitch Morse, Austin Corbett, Chilo Rochal was a higher-end pick of the Niners with Scott McLuhan there in charge. Uh, Josh Myers, a recent higher pick of the Green Bay Packers, who did not test, so we don't have, uh, or didn't test much, I should say. He ended up with a 29-inch vert. That's pretty good. For a man who's six foot five, 310, uh, 310 pounds, center, but was perceived to have some position flexibility. What seems to be important, and we didn't have this number for Myers, but we had it for a lot of others, is quickness here. 462 short shuttle or quicker. You had half of the players that we studied that were taken in this range. Again, only one first round pick. So Maybe that's something to take away when it comes to the prototypical Patriots. Guys that are projected to go in the first round, those guys aren't going to be prototypes in all likelihood <laughs> because that's just not what this executive tree has really valued in the first round before. Second round, sure. Number of different options. Third round, definitely. First round, not so much. So maybe that means no Graham Barton, if you're a big Graham Barton fan out of Duke, played tackle at Duke, but looks like an interior lineman this year. Um, Jackson Powers Johnson out of Oregon. Looks like a center, a maybe plays guard because he's a he's a big fella, but he very well could be a first round pick as well. It's probably going to be too rich for the Patriots under Elliot Wolf to be spending a pick there, even if they trade back into the first round. Also, not really the need that some of these other positions are, so you, you wouldn't be surprised if they passed on this position, any of the interior line positions, early early in the draft. But four six two or quicker short shot. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention, aside from the versatility, is that if you don't have that short shuttle time, the guys that were drafted early do have something that helps them stand out, and typically it's their explosiveness. It's either the vertical jump or the broad jump. You know, you have guys that are in the 93rd percentile in terms of the vertical. That was Jermaine Effetti, 32 and a half inches. Uh, pretty damn explosive. Uh, but high-end broad jumps, those will help you too. Last thing to mention, big-time programs. And really outside of Austin Corbett, you're talking Big Ten and SEC. Mitch Morse is Missouri. Jermaine Effetti, SEC. Ethan Posick, Big Ten. Damian Lewis, LSU, SEC. Gabe Jackson, Mississippi State, SEC. Elton Jenkins, SEC. Josh Myers, out of Ohio State, Big Ten. So. Is that intentional? Is it? Does it just so happen that these players, generally speaking, go to bigger programs? Again, the Austin Corbett pick would be an indication that they're not dead set on taking one of these guys that's gone to a blue blood program. But for the most part, these guards and centers have. So where does that leave us for this year? Very quickly, we'll run through it here. The guys who come through with the quickness that we're looking for specifically that 4.62 short shuttle time or better and went to big time programs, there ain't that many of them. Let's go to Arkansas. Bo Limmer and Brady Latham, believe it or not. Teammates at Arkansas. Really, really quick. I don't know what's in the water there, uh, but these guys have figured it out. Big enough bodies to play on the interior of the line and enough quickness. 
They come from these SEC schools. I've got to include them on the list. Are these guys going to be high, high end picks? No, they're not. But if you're the Patriots and you don't want to invest a super high pick and somebody along the interior of the offensive line, maybe one of these Razorbacks is the guy for you. Then there's Carson Barnhart out of Michigan. Did not get the short shuttle time we were looking for at the combine, but then did it as pro day. Usually what NFL teams will do is they'll just take your best time, pro day or combine. They, generally speaking, don't really care. Uh, but they want a number from one of their scouts, been verified. There is a process to, to making sure that you've got the best information possible. Uh, but Carson Barnhart from that talented Michigan Wolverines offensive line, he qualifies for this conversation as well. Some guys that that don't necessarily go to the programs, the types of programs that we're talking about, and it's no slight on these programs. These are good programs too, but these would be the Austin Corbett corollary additions to this conversation. Cooper Beebe might be the best player on this list. Has the quickness that you're looking for. 9-3-0 RAS score. Tough, physical, really smart. He's on the list out of Kansas State. Christian Mahogany, local guy out of BC. He's on this list. Dominic Pooney from Kansas. Good size, good quickness. Roger Rosengarden. Is he a tackle? Is he a guard? For this list, some question there. If you're a little bit of a tweener, might not be a bad thing. Means you've got position versatility. Ridiculous athlete. If you get an RAS on him that lists him as an interior offensive lineman as opposed to a guard, it jacks that number all the way up to a 997. So if you're looking to transition someone from tackle to guard, he might be at the top of the list. Mason McCormick out of North Dakota State. Tanner Bartolini, another big-time program guy with big-time quickness. The best short shuttle at this year's draft. Keep an eye on that name. Tanner Bortolini out of Wisconsin. Might be the name to mention here. Those are some of the names that we're really focused on. Trevor Keegan from Michigan, another one. Good athlete, didn't have the, the quickness time that we were looking for, but athletic enough, explosive enough in some other ways. Same for Brandon Coleman out of TCU, Christian Haynes from UConn. All these guys worth mentioning. All these guys going to be on our prototypical Patriots list. It's a longish list, which means you probably should wait if you're really dead set on getting a guard or getting the center of the future. If you feel as though some of these linemen that you've drafted over the course of the last couple of years aren't doing it for you as a new Patriots regime. Maybe you wait third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round to go and grab one of these guys. And you might have something there because they check a lot of boxes for what this Ron Wolf tree has wanted in the past. All right, guys, that's it. Thanks so much to Marshall Newhouse. Thanks so much to Ross Tucker. Thanks so much to John the Skull Crusher Henry, who was absolutely cranking out podcasts left and right. Patriots stock podcast, Celtic stock podcast. Go listen to that if you're not already. And of course, the next Pats podcast. We really appreciate you guys listening as frequently as you do. This is our time of year. We love this time of year. Tis the season, draft season. We're going to continue to hammer you with next Pats content. So make sure you're keeping an eye out for those. Next week, we're going to continue to double you up. We've got that many conversations to unload on you. We're going to double you up with some draft conversations next week on next Pats. So we'll talk to you then next time. Next time.